you're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Hello, welcome to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Its purpose is to dissect horror films, both old and new. This current season, we've been dedicating to the late, great Wes Craven, and we've been scrutinising and dissecting the middle years of his career, uh, which I'm dubbing the nightmare years because I'm bookending it with a nightmare on Elm Street and ending it with his second directorial um, look into that franchise, which was called Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Um, and everything that comes in between. And we're, we're kind of like sort of towards the end of that road trip now as we're about to talk about Shocker. Um, and I know that we've just uh, recently, uh, going back a few podcasts now, but we were just talking about a serpent, sorry, the serpent and the rainbow. And we've just kind of rounded out with a couple of the, uh, uh, we're about halfway through the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise sessions. So we are kind of very much right in the, right in the middle of this chunk now. Um, and about to discuss Shocker. Before we do, I should introduce myself. I'm the lead surgeon and uh, host of the podcast series. My name is Saul Moate. Joining me on this episode is Miles Davies. Welcome aboard, Miles. Glad to be aboard. Hello. Hey, mate. Hey, good to have you back. Um, so, um, and I'm trying to remember, I should probably have looked this up as well, but what the last one that you worked on with us, I think, was um, Deadly Friend. Um, That's right. So uh, a few few podcasts back now. Um, so um, and uh, obviously we <laughs> we well and truly we, we annihilated that one. <laughs> yeah, but I but I, I find this as an interesting one that kind of like to bring this one up because I, like between this and uh, between Shocker and uh, Deadly Friend, as I mentioned, was the Serpent and the Rainbow, um, which actually did fairly well for Wes Craven from a critical point of view. Um, on on a budget kind of perspective, it kind of just it sort of did well. Um, mm. but it's still kind of uh, revered quite highly. It's like number f- if you look at on IMDb on like best Wes Craven movies, it's like number four. I'm going to have to give it another go because I remember watching it when I was younger and and I it was billed as a zombie movie, so I kind of went, oh, cool zombie yeah. movie. Nobody's done a zombie movie for years, yeah. and I was like, I was so invested in, in sitting down and watching a zombie movie. And then it just wasn't. And I was like, yeah. what in the fuck is this? Yeah, so, yeah. It's actually but, like, yeah, everybody keeps revering it and saying it's really good. And I'm just like, okay, maybe I should give this another go. I, I would actually recommend it, mate, because like I, I did the same thing. I read what well, this, because I only watched it for the first time before the podcast that we did. And I, um, I went in with exactly the same um, avenue and kind of was expecting it to be um, a zombie film. Uh, and it's it's a voodoo film essentially is what it is, um, but it's very much about drugs and you know and you know the psychotic kind of responses that drugs has. Uh, but it was based on a book of the same name about a, a guy, a botanist who went out to Haiti to uncover this drug that is supposedly reawakening the dead, um, and that's kind of what it is. And it's it goes on a very different avenue to that. So and that's kind of how it should have been built really. Yeah, um, it's it, it's probably up to that point his best um, movie as far as gravitas is concerned and, and depth. Mm-hmm. Um, it does get a bit convoluted along the way and gets a bit lost at the very end. I felt, but um, I think Bill Pullman's brilliant in it, and he he really kind of mm-hmm. uh, pulls everything together. Um, yeah, I really I do recommend it. I, if people want to watch a horror, I'd probably say it's, it, you're you're not coming at it from the right point of view. Yeah, uh, it's just a very good kind of dark drama, essentially. Yeah, yeah, it seems that way. Yeah, I'll give another go. I will. I'll, I'll, I promise. I, I do like Bill Pullman. I think he's um he's huh. such a underrated actor. Yeah, I agree. I like, I, and this was like right after Spaceballs, so it's kind of like uh-huh. that. that time yeah, time. yeah. It's that would people would have been coming at it from wrong angle there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. Very much so. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we come to like shocker, and uh, and so this is why I kind of like the fact that you put your hand up for both this and Deadly Friend because yeah. they're very similar in the sense of that they kind of a little bit um, under the radar, a little bit unknown, but kind of had a bit of an impact at the time they were released. Um, so it'd be kind of interesting to get your take on it. But before we kind of give our overall consensus of where it is now and how does it stand up to date with the modern audience and all that stuff that we we tend to bow out with um 
uh, what, what was your early memory of this movie? When did you first come across Shocker? I I actually saw this at the cinema. Oh, cool. I, I, I saw this, uh, I think I went to see this about two or three times. And I, I really liked it. I don't, know, I don't know what it was. It was just... It was just something about the film that I just kind of, I dug, I thought it was a fun film and it was just, you know, you cannot take it seriously in the slightest. <laughs> yeah. I, I've seen people say, I don't know if it's a horror or a comedy. I said like, well, can't it be both? Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, Peter Berg, I kind of liked him. I'd seen him in a movie called Never on Tuesday. Uh. And and so I, I, I'd just seen that at the video store I worked at and I was like, Oh yeah, he's quite good. I'll, I'll go and see this, and it's Wes Craven as well. So yeah, and, yeah, let's see. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, no, I really dug it back in the day. Yeah, and, you know, cool. I think I watched it a gazillion times when it was on video as well. Sure. So, but I hadn't actually seen it since probably the last time I saw it before I sort of watched it last night was oh, so well back. Must be like early nineties. Mm-hmm. So it's been a fair while, and you know what? It it's it's a bit shit, but <laughs> I always kind of knew it was a bit shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just kind of had to just invest yourself, just just invest in it, and just yeah. go. Yeah, I know it's going to be crap. I know it's going to be cheesy, and Peter Berg is acting in this. It's just so like bizarre i <laughs> i don't think i've ever seen him act in this particular way ever <laughs> or, or and you know he's a director now so he's like has, yeah. has yeah. Fucking, i'm sure he does like he's got the eraser out trying to rub it off <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. No, it wasn't yeah. that that was a different beat of it you got, you got me all messed up over the top. it's cr- it's great i love it i can just imagine wes craven just directing this young Guy, I, I mean, it was, it was what, when he was about twenty years old or something. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah, it did. Just, just more, Peter. More, <laughs> more cowbell. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, it was. Uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, like, and the thing is, like, I, I kind of, I, I'm trying to defend him a little bit because it's a very odd role to play. It's not a, hmm. not a very clear cut one because there's a lot, and and even the movie itself goes from straight up kind of um, almost a bit like a kind of a cock kind of thriller movie with obviously with a a sci-fi, yeah, yeah, with a a little bit of a sci-fi bent happening with the psychic kind of stuff that's happening. Mm. Or then it moves massively into a different shift into the sci-fi element. Um, Yeah. yeah, When uh, when he comes back um, in electronical form. Um, And yeah, so it it is an interesting one. And that's kind of how I'm probably going to tackle the movie as we just dissect it because to me it's definitely lives within three act world you know so we've got the, the oh, first definitely. act being the you know the, the aforementioned uh crime detective kind of thriller component the middle act being the whole kind of right we're moving into sci-fi kind of uh transmorphing kind of body takeover mm-hmm sci-fi world um before we get the climax where it's like where he's then now moving into uh that goes from obviously taking over bodies to then kind of getting into the tv set and going through the electronical kind of format so that's kind of like the the three sections if you will and for those that haven't watched the movie before you're probably thinking what the fuck are you talking about so um so you really are gonna need to watch this one i think to get a real understanding of it (laughs) Um, because it is a, it is kind of a bit kind of messy, a bit conv- convoluted. Um, I, w- I will say this: like I, I watched it. This was the first time I've ever seen it. It's, I'm finding that a lot with the Wes Craven stuff, like the oh, okay. pocket of these movies that I'd never seen. I remember really clearly being on the video shelves as a kid. Um, I I the video cover. You know, VHS, you know, cover and and seeing it there. But it's just again, it was one of those ones that just kept slipping me by, and I, and I never watched it. Um, so I did come at it quite, quite fresh. Um, obviously I'm still, even though I always end asking the question, does it still stand today? Um, I am kind of watching it from that point of view, but I kind of also watch it because of my age. I'm also watching with that, um, very kind of, um, uh, uh, X gen kind of viewpoint, um, of the movie as well. So it's, it's an interesting one. Um, but I will say that my 
and I've and I've read about stuff after the fact too. But my gut reaction was that it it felt like Wes Craven was trying to do um, a um, a nightmare on a nightmare on Elm Street Mark II. Um, yeah, in the sense that there was it, a lot of that in there. Yeah, you know, because essentially, like the villain is somebody that uh, then attacks people through the medium of TV. Essentially, is, is yeah. the crux of it. Um, rather than through their dreams, but we well, have it's essentially that. it's it's a serial killer that yeah. that um, operates via a supernatural like yeah. means, so a supernatural medium. So it's um yeah, it's exactly like Freddy. So yeah, it is, and like I um, there was a reviewer or somebody at the time that uh, apparently wrote. I'm just trying to find it um, with association to. It. So the the villain's name is Horace Pinker, um, and. Uh, basically said that um, Horace Pinker is Freddy Krueger for the electronic information age <laughs> um, was their response. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Um, and where's Craven? Like, well, initially when he kind of went to make this, he said that his intention was to make people aware of, of the media um, and how watching TVs or movies is, is almost like being unconscious or in a hypnotic state. Um, I, feel, I feel attacked there. Yeah, I haven't worked in TV for quite some years. Yeah, I feel yeah. absolutely attacked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How very dare Wes Craven? Yeah. I know TV is a wonderful format. Uh, it so doesn't like, make you brain dead. It makes you think. Of, but at that particular stage, we were getting Jake and the Fat Man and Matlock. So <laughs> yeah. That was the shit house well, TV that we used to get around that yeah, stage. Exactly. And that's the thing, like he, uh, in that same thing, I don't have the book to hand, but in the same book that I was referring to, um, he, it, it, I kind of, I didn't write it down in my notes, but he, he it, bust, it does go on beyond that because he does kind of mention that um, it's what was offered on TV, which was kind of a bit lackluster. And he said that there should be more scope. And obviously this was be back in like the, this was 1989 yeah. that this got released. Um, so he would have been probably, the, re- the interview probably took place maybe at the very most, 10 years after the fact. Um, oh. So we're still talking pre like uh, 2000s, you know? So, um, and TV. Yeah, there was no game of friends. And 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 yeah, exactly. Like there's, we've come a long way and it's probably at a point where he probably would go, oh, it's kind of it. Well, you know, TV arguably is, is the new, is the medium that's ruling it, not film. Yeah. I'm sure if he was in his heyday, he'd be yeah. making a TV series. So, oh, oh, like he pitched it as a TV series originally. Like this is the thing. I'm just going right. my notes again. So like it was a TV series idea that was called Dream Stalker. And it was about a youthful psychic who could track murderers through his dreams. A killer who could take over people's bodies as well. So that was like the cross between, the, you know, him tracking down his killer essentially. Um, so... Very well. I feel that I, I feel that some that's something that that the TV networks have used bits and pieces of already. Oh yeah, things, but... oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Like there's hallmarks of of it in a lot of things. Um, yeah. I'm going back to the. Uh, I'm jumping around a bit too, but going back to the Freddy thing, like with Wes Craven said, he wanted to make a competitor for Freddy, um, who is so strong that Freddy will be forced into retirement. <laughs> um, yeah, so he probably had, was jack of where Freddie was going because this point, as I said, would have been what well, we like nine eighty nine. So we would have been about maybe Dream Warriors had just come out. Maybe by that point, uh, not quite. Uh, yeah, Dream, yeah, it would have been Dream Child, yeah. Dream Master time. Oh, sorry, that was good. Dream Master Dream Child. Sorry, go go for it. What were you saying? Oh, I think um, yeah, it was the um, the part three, wasn't it? It was that was that yeah. had been that had happened. Yeah. So and yeah. that was that was awesome. I remember. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. And he had a lot of control over that too. But Yeah, that's right, because he didn't do part two, so he came yeah. back for part three, which is That's great. right, yeah, he came and scripted it. So like yeah, he, which is interesting because like he's obviously, you know, well he never had any intention of Freddie kind of living beyond part one. It was always mm. one off. And obviously uh, Bob Shea had a lot to say about that and wanted to make a franchise out of it. Adds you would expect from somebody from a film that basically created their, their uh, production house. Um, but yeah, so like, but I could see from Wes's point, Wes's point of view, it was like, ah, uh, you know, it's kind of, he, you know, it was already starting to morph into a very different beast, Freddy Krueger. So mm. he wanted this, he wanted somebody to kind of rally up against it, but you know, unfortunately Horace Pinker would never would, you know, 
Um, no. Yeah, so there's this throwaway line that he says to Jonathan at the end about, you know, don't uh, be careful when you turn the TV on again or something like that. So it was always hinted, like, potential sequels mm. and the like, but it never happened. Um, so, yeah, so there was, a lot, there was a lot around there. And it could have been a very different beast entirely because, you know, there was a lot, of, like, Wes Craven was looking for, like, no-name people uh, at mm. the time. And uh, Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac was put in there as a potential uh, to play Horace Pinker, which would have been All right. pretty interesting. Um, but as such, we get Mitch Pileggi, who a lot of people would know as Skinner from X-Files. Um, and I actually I actually dug his performance in this. Like, he was really good. He's right. Yeah, I, I would say he was probably the highlight of the, of the film, personally. You know what? I... I'm gonna I'm gonna admit something here. Yes. I've never sat down and watched X Files. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> sad thing is, I've actually seen the movies. You know the movies that they did afterwards, which is apparently shit. Um, and yeah. I I didn't mind them, uh, but I never watched the TV sh- show. But some, but I understood that Mitch Pelegi was quite successful in that. <laughs> Yeah, no, he was very good in it. Yeah, I have to admit, he was always. I, he, I always liked his character as Skinner as well. Was he the smoker or something? Or no, he... the smoker's a different guy. No. Oh, okay. But like, he was basically like uh, um, uh, Mulder and Skinner's uh, Mulder and Skinner, Mulder and Scully's boss. Essentially, is who he is in it. But like, oh, okay. it is all right. And, and like, remind me when we get offline, uh, Miles. But I can flick you maybe four or five episodes that I reckon you should watch. And you, don't, oh, okay. you probably don't need to watch any others unless you start getting into it. No, no, no. I, actually, I've seen one. I seen. I saw the one with uh, Bruce Campbell. Yeah, now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, because they are. They're hitting miss. They are because they're, they're basically yeah. they're concept shows. Each episode is a different concept. So, like, yeah, uh, you know, um, and I there are some that I still think stick. Um, I as standalone. So yeah, remind me and I'll flip them to you. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, that's probably enough of like all, all the gassing and stuff that's around it. Um, uh, let's let's start dissecting the uh, the plot, as it were. And I um, going off a very I may skip stuff out accidentally. Um, so remind me if I if I do Miles and I need to no worries on some stuff because I know there's a there's a whole lot of stuff. But as I said, we're going to look at um, uh, look at this in three sections. So the first section is around the kind of who this Horace Pinker guy is as a serial killer going around terrorizing the neighborhood and killing families essentially is, is his, is his, uh, MO. Um, as we find out with an expert exposition by yeah. the legendary John Tesh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Do you ever watch John Tesh on TV? Oh, no, I know. I'm aware of him. I was aware of yeah, him. You know, he was, he was like the host of entertainment tonight, like yes. one of the original hosts. Yes. And so he, he, he went off to pursue his piano career. He ended up like as a, as a Richard Clayderman type person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. Wow. <laughs> Well, I love that that they, you know, around this era, they used to give all of these like cameo TV roles yes. to the people from Entertainment Tonight. So I yes, see yes. was given in, I think Robocop. She's in one of the Robocops, and it's just to try and keep them on side. Yeah, so yeah. they give them a positive review because they're not going to shit house their own movie. No, no, no. <laughs> so <laughs> very clever at the, the networks. Or the oh yeah, for sure. Completely, completely. But yeah, check out John Tesh's uh, fabulous uh, piano career. It's. Uh, I will. I'm going to have to definitely if check. If you like the, the stylings of Richard Clayderman and, <laughs> and you know, reaching further, Andre Rieu. Oh wow! There we go. There you go. You're, you're really. Uh, you're really uh, setting this guy up. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, cool. So we have the news report that opens, as you said, um, and it's showing a victim being pulled away on the stretcher. Now, somewhere amongst this is a certain Heather Langenkamp uh, oh. playing one of the victims. So there's a few there, but I'm I'm not sure if she's the one. On no, the it's show. later on. It's later it's on. It's the one where he's holding her hostage at the top of the stairs. That's not her, really. Yeah, yeah, that's her. Uh, okay. All right. Cool. Um, I know the one you mean, but I thought that was. I thought it was early because it said first victim is her credit. And I was like, oh, maybe. Oh, all right. Uh, but cool. If that's her, that's fine. I was sure <laughs> it was her. I didn't recognize the teeth. <laughs> it, was a, it was a weird angle. She was on a weird angle because she was like looking up. Yeah, because so it was one of those cameos that you do when you're not really doing a cameo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, uh, yeah, so we get the whole time. We get a bit of backstory on the news report that this guy has killed 30 people. He's on the loose in LA. Um, and we, is it revealed? Uh, no, it's not revealed until. Okay, so they've written this. My notes don't make sense here, but um, the we also have the uh, Jonathan character that we meet, and he's playing uh, what we call gridiron football or American football, mm-hmm. um, and he's uh, the way we're kind of introduced to him is that he's a bit of a show off, isn't he? And he's a bit not really a bit self interested. Um, we see him actually just before that we see him kind of buying a soda can or, or something from a store yeah. uh, as they're watching the news and he's kind of um, he's kind of just he, if you don't like the news you know, switch it off yeah that's <laughs> right and there's that line that she says back to him is like um, I hope you I hope you oh damn it I was going to write this down too something like I hope you have uh, a be- better attitude with your life than you do with the news or something like that it's this kind of yeah. throwaway line that I thought oh that's kind of interesting um, but yeah so anyway so look he's showing off on the uh, field there's a girl there that's his uh, that's his sweetheart um, and um, and he's kind of showing off to her a bit too but because of that he's not really paying attention and he's getting kind of pummeled by the uh, a quarterback or no it wouldn't be a quarterback would be like a running defender, yeah like that. running touch or something yeah yeah so he, who uh, turns out to, I, I just assumed he was like the cocky quarterback and then he's got the big tough yeah ones. yeah that's right and I think it, it turns out this guy's called Rhino um, oh, of course he is <laughs> yeah who ends up being one of his like best mates yeah uh, <laughs> in the search for this he's the muscle down the track he's the muscle that's right um and yeah, so and then he kind of is a bit told to kind of shake it up, and again he pulls some kind of fancy moves, not looking where he's going, and then we get the comical ploughing himself into the post of the, you know, the football post essentially. That's right. Uh, knocking himself out, um, and this how how would you rate that accident in comparison to the wonderful bike accident in Deadly Friend? I thought it was actually pretty good. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm being too harsh, clearly. I kind yeah, of look, look I, mean, I, I knew it was coming because, yeah, yeah. like, I'd seen it before, obviously, course, and I knew yeah. that's where he gets his psychic powers. Yeah. And, but a good solid bong on the head. That's it. And haven't we all just run into a post every so often? So, yeah, and um, I never got any psychic powers. What gives? What's yeah, that? Yeah, I know. All I got was a sore head. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but... It was okay. It was, it was all right. right. It was comical. It was meant to it be was comical. A bit comic, and you know what yeah, the funny yeah. thing is, actually? It was a good setup for that because he did two comical falls. Yes. And it kind of set it up to, you know what? Maybe you're not supposed to be taking this too seriously. <laughs> it had that sort of that moment. Because then when he gets <laughs> the, yeah, right. the coach sort of leaning over him, he starts giving him shit. And I can't remember what he says. He is like, <laughs> All right, you okay? Now get off the field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's and you go, okay, so this is a bit of a cheesy one. one. Yeah, it was a swim moment. And when he goes off the field, he then has another fall over the uh, drinks cart that's on the side. Oh, that's right. We yeah. helped with his mate, Ted Ramey. Ted Ramey! Yay! See, this has got already got good pedigree already. So yeah, it's, uh, fantastic. You no, know, one of the Rameys. Awesome. Absolutely. This looked like one of his first roles, other than being a shemp. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you could be right there. Um, yeah, 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 he's right. And he's playing like this kind of medic, kind of, yeah, the nerdy friend yeah. of some sort. Yeah, yeah. oh, sorry, I just knocked the mic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll have to, um, while we're talking, I'll see if I can find the, um, I'll see if I can find the, um, uh, his credits to see how early on that was in his career. Yeah, um, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at him now. He's he's quite early on. Yeah, he basically only done a couple of short films. He'd done some stuff for his brother, and uh, he did uh, Evil Dead one and two. He'd done um, uh, an episode of Alf. Oh, far out! Yeah, there you go. I see it all, Ramy. <laughs> 
<laughs> and what else did you do? Crime Wave as well. Was it the Coen Brothers or Sam Raimi? Sam Raimi. Uh, written, Sam Raimi. Written by Ethan Cohen. Yes, that's right. That yeah, so because they all knew each other, so that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So now, yeah, very early on. That's right. Very early on. Um, and he's got a cool look. I always liked his look. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. So yeah. So basically, the the girlfriend um, of Jonathan um, then takes him back home because he's like you know kind of really out of it um yeah to, to look after him um and then we get the first of uh like a his psychic powers kicking in and he has that kind of dream sequence yeah yeah where he sees his mum trying to protect his little brother is it brother yeah or sister yeah. brother or sister, um, yeah yeah, and then we get the uh, the first time we really see Horace's character in there, and he's kind of threatening the family and going to mm. kill him. And like um, Jonathan Parker's kind of a bit standoffish. And uh, but I then thought the bit where he's walking across, walking along the street with the kids running past him in the background oh, yeah. and they all disappear was oh, I awesome. forgot about that. It's yeah, one of my, it's, you know what? It's one of my favorite little ghost yeah. bits in in any movie. Yeah, and I think it's so clever. But it's so subtle, and it's just such a little yeah. throwaway thing. But I love seeing that moment every time I've seen this 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 film. Yeah, it's just one of those moments that I just go, "Oh, that's fucking cool." Yeah, it's so, like I'm really glad you mentioned that, Miles, because I I dug it too. And I what I liked about it is the way that the uh, the facade slowly drips away. So like you've got all the mm. the characters start falling away, and eventually like he's just on the street with his girlfriend Allison. Everything's quite dark, and he's like, "Why is yes. why are they standing? Up, why are they still sitting up watching TV?" Um, and then he turns around, and his his girlfriend's not, not there anymore. And yeah, then he goes into the house and gets confronted. Yeah. With his feet. Um, that was cool. Yeah, no, very much so, very much so. And he, uh, yeah, so he goes in, and yeah, ha- there's that whole kind of confrontation. And basically, like he sees, um, I, I think he sees. Uh, before first half, he sees his other brother with his fingers cut off. Oh yeah, um, dead, dead clearly. And then he goes up to the bedroom and sees the mum protecting the other kid. And then they they kind of there's a confrontation and then they end up getting killed. Um, and he wakes up um, and he thinks it's just a dream. Uh, he has some interaction with with uh, yeah he Horace, does he, he? yeah yeah that's right. So Horace lunges to, for, for him and he just sort of wakes up. So there is something there, like he, it's not just psychic, he's actually, right. maybe it's just a psychic connection type thing. It's just, That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there is, a, there is a connection between the two, which obviously is going to be kind of paramount. For, for Explained later. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, I, and I like that too. I like the idea of that kind of, that it kind of gave it a bit more bones to it just being just this regular psychic kind Rather of. Rather than just watching. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the, he wakes up and, you know, the girlfriend's there and she goes, oh, you, said, you, you took a bad bump on the head, so I took you home and, um, I hope you're, you know, how are you okay? And he's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be all right. She's had a bad dream. And he goes to his mum and dad's house and that's where, he, you know, the cops are all over the place and, mm. and, and he's like, the dad stops him from going in, doesn't he? Yeah, that's right. He says, don't go in there, don't go in. It's, you don't need to see that. Um, but basically, like, yeah, it's essentially the, the crux of it is is what uh, Jonathan dreamed has actually happened. For yeah. The guy that's killed the family. And the reason for it is that he targeted the family because the dad is a cop investigating the crime. Mm. So it's meant to be a bit of a revenge thing that's, that's occurred. Yeah. Um, the dad is... Played by Michael Murphy. Murphy, yeah. Um, and I was meant to look up what he's been in because he's one of those faces that I just went, I know you. <laughs> yeah, he's been in stacks of stuff. He's like, yeah. uh, I'm, he's in Manhattan. He's in, yeah. Uh, he's a, it tends to be like a bit of a support role, doesn't he? Because he was, uh, yeah, he's a good character actor. He's quite well known. Yeah, X Men um, Last Stand. And- yeah, that's right. Magnolia and, and, and at one point. Yeah. What else yeah. you got? Bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's in pretty much. He's he's one of those guys who just appears in everything and then yeah. as a background character. 
Yes, that's right. That's Magnolia. Right. Yeah. Um, There's lots of like yeah. Law and Order stuff he's been in and that as well. Like yeah, a lot of shit, a lot of good stuff as well. So Batman Returns. <laughs> oh, no worries. Oh, that's right. As the mayor. Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of because it was a similar yeah. kind of age that I was kind of thinking in my head when I was watching Shock. I, was like, <laughs> I remember seeing him at a similar age. Yeah. That's probably what it is. Um, yeah, so he's essentially the cop and he's been investigating. So that's why, you know, they've been kind of hunted down for this and killed, killed the family. Um, mm-hmm. Then the next kind of section is, um, and I'm pausing there while I have a little think. Um, Sorry, that's a big pause. I can't think. Somewhere along the line, he has another moment, doesn't he? There's a connection before that. Is there another one before he goes to the uh, the other house where he chase? You know, he goes up the stairs and they follow him. I thought there was like another. Doesn't he have another dream sequence first? And oh, that's okay. where he, there's something happens anyway where he ends up. He has to try and convince his dad. Like he's his stepfather as well. He's a sorry foster father. Father, that's right. um, not his real father, um, but he has to try and convince him that he's had that he dreamt everything that happened, and he actually tells the story. He basically that's right, yeah, yeah, the family, and that's where the dad's like, "How can you know that?" Because he knows that Jonathan didn't go in to the building where the family was killed. Um, so yeah, so there is that kind of whole that whole moment where he has to try and convince the the, fam, uh, the father, essentially, and the cops. He does so, and then the next kind of, oh, he gets, that's right, he gets Rhino to help him, doesn't he? And they fall asleep. That's right. And he yeah. says, it's a similar thing to, like, when Nancy says, you need to wake me up. So, yeah. This, you know, this moment. So, like, he, he goes to sleep, and he basically, in the car, gets Rhino to wake him up at a certain point. So there's this moment where he dreams the interaction with the this girl, uh, on the stairwell and again there's that psychic connection that happens and I think he throws the girl or he does he kill the girl or anyway there's a slight difference between he, the two and he throws uh, her down the stairs yeah, yeah that's that's, right. that's Heather Langenkamp yeah that's the one you were saying was that that's right yeah that's what I was saying yeah so because uh, the, the cops bust in as well that's it and yeah, then yeah. They, they they he puts a knife up to her throat and yeah. then just basically throws her down the stairs and then escapes yes that's right so so that's dreamt first, and then he convinces the cops to and his dad to go. Ah, oh, you know, go over to this place. Or does that, or do they just turn up? They have to turn up. Anyway, the crux of it is, is that then he then pursues uh, Pinker on foot, um, mm. and they end up on the top of a rooftop and and have a big kind of fight out scene. And Jonathan's just getting beaten to shit, essentially. <laughs> He's, he's mm. really a match for, for Pinker. Um, and eventually, though, the cops turn up uh, just as Pinker's about to kill him. Um, and they and they arrest him. Is this... No, no, because this ha- that happens later, doesn't ah, it? shit. So there you go. So how it goes, yeah. does the girl... He, he, he kills the girlfriend. Yeah. Like, Horace kills her first. And then that's when he goes under again to try and get him. Okay, so that's what that's what I thought. So there was a sequence that I'm missing out. Then, uh, ah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, he gets away. That's right. So he gets away, um, mm. and then he knows that there's a psychic connection with him and the Jonathan character. So he, mm. and we already know that this is his thing. If somebody gets too close, he goes and kills the people close to yeah. him. So he then hunts down uh, the girlfriend and he brutally kills her. Yeah. And I really like that extra, That There's a bit of a... Um, I think they're pursuing or trying to track, track him down. Oh, they, they get to his warehouse, don't they? Because they, he dreams of right. the warehouses and they, and they get the cops going in and that's when he realises that they're getting too close and he manages to... Get, he kills a lot of cops, but he manages to get away. They get mm. And uh, then realizing that the he connection to the girlfriend, place, then, so. yeah, then he goes for the girlfriend, kills the girlfriend, and this time, like somehow, the cops are shit in this because they let him in. They are. <laughs> I remember this. I was like, 
how have they let this guy just wander into a crime scene? I know. So. And, and they're like, they basically they're like part of the ways for you. Yeah, yeah, it's like the, the Red Sea being parted, the Blood Red Sea being parted, and oh, yeah, it's so God. shit. The cops in this is unbelievable. Yeah. They couldn't catch a cold in this. No, no. They, <laughs> it's amazing. He even gets to the bathtub and he's like touching blood, and you just go, "What in the fuck?" You know, I've watched enough Luther in my life. Even you know, <laughs> hey, you, you know, Luther, Luther what says to to uh, to, his, to his mate, you know, walk yes. into a crime scene, you put your hands in your pockets, yeah, you know, yeah. so you don't touch anything. Yes, and, and they just make a mockery of, of crime scenes. I'm not see. This is why they couldn't didn't catch uh, John Bonnie Ramsey. <laughs> John Bonnie Ramsey. Because they're fucking useless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they really are. They really were. They really were. At this particular moment in time, American cops were fucking useless. <laughs> there was a Netflix series in in their ineptitude in this of the, of this movie. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Shockingly, made the murder, murdering the murder, or something. Yeah, I'll tell you. That's it. That's right. <laughs> New York City cops. They're not too smart. Um. Anyway sideways um yeah so look essentially like yeah he he's killed the girlfriend that was quite that was a really brutal scene like and i and the chopping and chaining of the scene between yeah the act of the murder and and the bumbling detectives essentially um yeah. was kind of interesting and and i dug it and a big, big turning point for the kid because then that's it he's got he's just p- pissed ass and he yeah. wants he wants he wants this guy to suffer. So he, that's where he goes into that dream again, pins where he is and he goes on a hunt for him himself to draw him out. And that's where he, we get the scene where he confronts him and they end up on the rooftop. Yes. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So sorry about that. I did jump around. I did apologize. I was going to jump around and probably get it wrong. Um, and that's why it's good to have an offsider like you on my side there, Miles. Thanks there for that. Um, yeah. So they end up on, basically he ends up getting called. Cool. And you know he's a he's a he's a um, he's a serial killer, so you know he's going to get the death penalty. So of course he's going to get in this particular state, he's going to get wired to the chair, and he's going to get. Fired. I mean, they, they, they kind of rush this process through. They like, do, I yeah. mean, I know we're not supposed to be taking it seriously, but you see, I've seen enough uh, crime shows and and real life of the crime shows to see that you know he. He's in jail, like he's arrested one minute and then he's on the electric chair the, the next. Usually they sit on death row for like 30 odd years before yeah, they get yeah. electrocuted. So yeah, he's got plenty of time, you know, but yeah, they, exactly. they rush this one through. Maybe it was because he killed a cop family. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. That's always the excuse in, 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 in movies anyway, you know, you kill the cop's family. The rules don't count. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's like um, you know, uh, wasn't it like uh, with you know, in Cold Blood, the two killers in that, Richard Hickok and um, oh yeah, you know, that's you know, Truman Capote's detail of you know, they were on death row for ages too, and they you know, yeah, you know, it's a case in point of like I know exactly what you're saying. There's um, and the whole kind of court process and the law, we all know that none of this is ever speedy. Um, no. But yeah, for the sake of the the show, I mean, it would have been a pretty grueling thing. They had to they have to kind of jump to the next bit because uh, exactly that, that's kind of the end of the first act. He's cool, right? So yeah, they're going to kill him. So they're not going to go. Oh, and then thirty years later, they waited for <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. him to grow up, and <laughs> he pursued right. him in a in the court of law. Finally, got through all the appeals process, yeah. and that's when he, they executed him. <laughs> So. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> oh, really far out. Um, yeah, so yeah, so we get that bit, but like we we get the whole scene. Like uh, the interesting thing here is how how angry and bloodthirsty Jonathan's character is. He wants vengeance. He wants to see this guy. Yeah, right, right yeah. on the um, And a very kind of manic response. Like, I need to see it happen, Dad. Don't let me go. <laughs> Oh, hello. I need to see it. We've earned, our, earned the rights to it. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they let him go. He's like, yes. How do you earn, earn the right to see somebody die? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. No idea. <laughs> only in America. Uh, only in America and only uh, in this film. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, interesting that it happens. But, like, there's a delay in the process of trying to get him to the chair because he's doing that. He's doing a weird kind of 
sacrificial um, satanic uh, yeah. ritual in front of yeah. a TV. In front of a TV, and he's got the wires and stuff kind of hooked <laughs> up, and he basically electrocutes himself. Uh, he goes, "Give it to me! Give, give it, to it to me!" me. And there's this weird kind of energy thing that happens. Uh, I love, I love the energy uh, thing because the energy thing just goes. You got it, baby. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, <laughs> Satan is a 1970s pimp. <laughs> hey, baby. Yeah, you got it, baby. You got it, baby. This guy, just give this guy everything he wants. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, Another reason not to take it seriously. No, Obviously, yeah, it's really like not. A lot of it's comedy, so. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so that happens, but they still, despite that, they still take him to the chair, uh, even though he, even though he probably should have been taken down to infirmary and checked out. Uh, yeah. They're like, no, 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 there's people waiting. There's money to be spent. Um, so yeah, he gets taken along, and he basically sees the people in the, uh, you know that's come to witness. You know what? Can I can't backtrack here? Yeah, go on. The, the, there's a shot of the the, the electric chair chamber. Yes, and it's all one shot as they're setting up this 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 the electric chair. Like, it's fucking clever, mm-hmm. and it's like because I watch a lot of Mister Robot, so they do like ah. entire episodes in one shot. Yes, and or or Birdman, you know, where they they did it all, all apparently in one shot. Yep, yep. Um, but this was actually done like way ahead, way before any of that shit happened. And it's you know the shot probably only goes on for about forty five seconds. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. But that's a long time in, yes. in 1989 terms. Yes. And so good on him. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, the guy that walks into the chamber, yes. he walks extremely slowly, like so beyond supernaturally slowly yeah. because he's trying to make sure that he, everybody hits their mark in the right spot. I, can, I had to rewind it twice just to watch him just go, okay, I've got to be here at this particular time because that's when all the people in the background are going to walk in. Yeah. And then when I walk around again, I'll, I'll flick it play with the electrics on it, switch the lights on, then I'll walk around and that's when the lady walks in yeah. and and then I switch on the other stuff and, and it's all one shot. So you can see the uh, the camera going sort of, obviously they've got it on some kind of little trolley that they're just sort of wheeling around the chair, which is really clever. I, I just, I dug it. I, 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 I It was a moment for me. <laughs> it, it was good for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Um, so was that the uh, – are we talking about the executioner? Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I'm, I'm, again, may need to edit around this, but I, I thought I read something about who he was. Uh, oh. And I'm just kind of quickly looking it up. Was he 79? Oh. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yes, I could, I'll, I'll continue. Because his name's Bruce Wagner, and he was oh. the uh, – co-writer for a nightmare on elm street three dream warriors uh, and also uh i want to say he what else did he write oh he he worked on uh another he never picked up or it got it only lasts like five eps but he worked on the um the concept of a tv series of rose craven around the time this was released called the people next door Hmm. The concept of that was it was around. It was basically a group, a, a cartoonist who's able to physically materialize his wildest fantasies, um, and it was done as a TV series. And as I said, I think it only lasted um, uh, five episodes. Uh, it says ten episodes on on here, but I think it only aired five episodes. And the, and the main dad, the dad character, I think was uh, is Jeffrey Jones. You know the guy who yeah yeah adding Beetlejuice uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so he was behind that too. But yeah, so I thought I, I was like, I'm pretty sure that was somebody that was known in the series. Um, oh, sorry, in in the film circles. Cool. Okay, so we There's get a few you. cameos in this. Like, yeah, I mean, obviously we've got uh, Ted Raimi, and we've got uh, actually the, the girl that gives him the the drink at the beginning is Jessica Ra- Craven. Yeah. Um, uh, is that, yeah. That's Wes Craven's daughter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so she's in it, and then there's like Timothy Leary's in it a bit later on, and and a few others here and there. So yeah, oh, it's I, I, cool. I, I, I think he had a lot of fun with this one. Yeah, I, I'll mention it because uh, I'll mention a couple of the others because yes, Tim Leary, obviously uh, the you know the spiritual guru, 
uh, with the psychedelic kind of enhancement stuff at the time around oh, 70s, 80s stuff. So by this time, he was mm-hmm. a pretty known figure in America. And he plays the TV evangelist uh, on the TV screens uh, a bit later on. And we'll get to his character later. But there was a, um, Wes Craven's son's also in this, Jonathan Craven. Oh, okay. Um, he's the jogger um, on the... Um, out, you know, uh, during one of the body kind of... Oh, the park thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. That's and probably cool. the other person I should mention is um, is Kane Roberts, who plays the road worker. So he's... Um, he's uh, uh, he was in um, uh, Alice Cooper. Um, he's the, uh, the... Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, so he, yes. So he plays the road worker guy and he's someone else who gets taken over at one point in the film as well. Because it's, it's, it's got a real sort of cock rock feel to this thing. Obviously, they've got like a bit of the heavy rock going on and Megadeth playing and shit like yeah, that. So, that's right. you know, band, band, and Alice Cooper does feature in a cameo later on as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In one of the TV clips or something. So I don't think he's done anything specifically for the movie, but it's, it's um it's you know, he's in there anyway, so... But yeah, there's like a heavy rock sort of version of a horror movie. <laughs> Get in the yeah, yeah, on. it is like there, there is a, like a Megadeth do the cover of of Alice Cooper's um, No More Mister Nice Guy. That's right, it's one of the ones in there. And there's a whole bunch of I think the Kiss or something do. Is it Kiss? Does yeah, it? they do the first song, and then uh, Megadeth do the um, uh, the cover the yeah, uh, No More Mister Nice Guy. So you pop in there as well and and stuff. Yeah, so. but apparently, <laughs> apparently, Wes Craven wasn't a fan of the music. He wasn't his. Choice. I don't imagine so. <laughs> It wasn't his thing, but yeah. I don't think he ever did it again. So <laughs> no, no. it's like, but then like I'm sitting there. This is how tragic I am. I'm sitting there because in in around this time frame, this is exactly the music I was listening to. So I was just like <laughs> having having a nostalgic flashback as I was watching this. Oh uh, man, me too, man. Yeah. I had a heavy metal friends around this era, yeah. and I was just like, oh my god, I was <laughs> Motley Crue, all these those guys. So yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so I kind of went, I went away pretty much digging it, but I probably uh, <laughs> did my lonesome on that one. Well, I'm happy. Um, yeah, so we have anyway. So we have the electric chair scene, and this is where like the you know it has the it doesn't you know it has that moment where he takes him a long time to die. Um, and it's like well, he's not really dying per se, um, and they're trying to fry him, and he kind of basically says he kind of taunts Jonathan's character as well from the chair and all that stuff. Um, and they send the doctor in to um, check on him, and she gets kind of electrocuted and on the floor, and then uh, eventually, like the the, the body of um, of uh, Parker dies, doesn't he? Um, and we get kind of like the climax kind of like there's a whole load of stuff going on and basically like all these ambulances are coming in the cops and stuff and the uh the doctor gets taken off in in a uh is it in a police car or an am- oh is it in the ambulance anyway but anyway but then she is soon revealed that she's not who she seems to be and kind of attacks the drivers and mm. it goes off the road and and we see the car blow up from the from the point of view of Jonathan's character um so it's kind of insinuated that uh, uh Parker has jumped into the doctor's body at this point Pink uh, yeah and then he continues to do so in a series of uh body swapping dominoes throughout the course of this next section of the film um and it seems like uh, Jonathan's the only one that's wise to this, um, yeah. Essentially, and it's this whole kind of he's on the run trying to chase after this this guy, um, and yeah, he jumps into like uh, little girl, yeah, little girl uh, sequence. The oh, this, guy, this was one of the things as well where like um, uh, so some what some critic kind of really lambasted Craven. Uh, for having this girl character swear. Um, and it was just like, this is an outrage, blah, 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 uh, <laughs> so I, But I kind of like the fact that she does it because 
it's, I do too. It's not her. It's it's clearly yeah. this other guy that's in her body, and it's just like, dude, get but over. You know what? They did the same thing about um, uh, Kickass with uh, what's her face, yeah, uh, Chloe, Grace Moret, same Probably, cunt, yeah. and and it was just like, it was just like, oh, fucking get over it. Yeah, so, you know, people swear. You know, well, that's the little, thing, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm mean, like, but you, we could argue whether or that's right or not. But essentially, if movies are meant to reflect um, human society, like it's everyday language, you know, like it's yeah, you can't, exactly. You can't just suddenly ignore it. Um, Besides, she's, she's possessed with a um a, the 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 spirit of a serial killer. That's so. right. That's right. Yeah, I know. And why would she swear if she was yeah. possessed by the spirit of a serial exactly? Killer? And, and I just love the bit where she then uh, she hops into the you know the digger, <laughs> the digger. and nearly ploughs Jonathan over with it. <laughs> you know what I don't get though. Yeah. I mean, he keeps hopping into all these bodies, but he still keeps having, having that gimpy leg. Now, yeah. should he shouldn't have that? No, because no, <laughs> no. all his bodies are fine. Yeah, that's right. And, so he, he's susceptible, and they they say it later on as well. They say he's susceptible to the bodies. Um, so if their bodies are unhealthy, then he will die with the body, or yeah. he will yeah. on the body. But he's all, but he's he's having an effect on the body as well by giving him this dodgy limb. Yeah, yeah. That he shouldn't have. So I, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. But it's the way that the audience can go. Oh, that's him. Yeah, <laughs> Look, yeah. Well, leg. Yeah. <laughs> it's so that Jonathan can even leg. identify him as well. You know. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we get this kind of pursuit. So, yeah, so, like, the girl, he goes attacking the girl and then, uh, uh, oh, no, no, there's the cop first, isn't it? The cop turns up, the, supposedly the dead cop turns up at the door oh. first. And then that's where the pursuit first goes. And the cop is one of the worst shots in movie history. <laughs> um, cannot, cannot shoot this guy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then he ends up, uh, and then the girl gets taken over. Then the their girl, <laughs> the girl's mum turns up, and she thinks that Jonathan's attacking her daughter. Yeah, I quite like that exchange because I felt like it was quite believable. <laughs> um, and then, and then, like essentially, the girl he he leaves the girl, jumps into the mother, but then soon um, the road worker played by Kane Roberts dude turns up, and then he for for no apparent reason he then jumps into his character, his body. Um, when I'm just like going, well, what? Why don't you just stay in the girl in the mum's body? There's, there was no real yeah. need to jump at that point, but he does. Um, and then we kind of, that kind of gets away anyway. Essentially, is, is the is the end of that. And then we get that. Well, moment. he throws the um, he throws the necklace in the lake as well. Ah, that's like, right. And I was <laughs> I was half expecting La- uh, Lady of the Lake to reach out and grab it, <laughs> disappear into the water again. Um, but yeah, that's right. The, the charm kind of gets thrown away. Uh, so, which is his protection essentially, which was the necklace yeah. by his girlfriend. Yes. Uh, which again is again makes no sense why this particular token, uh, this token, <laughs> this energy around it. But it does. It's a symbol of true love. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> and it ends up in the lake, as you said. That's right. Yeah. That. And so then, I think then most of the most of the so-called rules of this film they, they tend to make up on the spot. I reckon. There's, oh, and there's, 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 there's quite probably quite a lot of inconsistencies to this, or quite yeah. a lot of moments where you kind of go, "Hang on a minute, why?" <laughs> That's it. Wait, wait. Why is the necklace a protection? Yeah, you protect her. I think you prefaced it earlier. It's one of those movies, you've just got to let it take you along. Yeah. Don't ask questions, just let it take you. Um, yeah, because it didn't protect the girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He fucking died. I know. That's right, that's right. Can't have been that good. No. <laughs> um, okay, so, yeah, so anyway, so then we have the bit where he gets away. Uh, there's a moment where... He's exp- is he explaining it to the coach and and Rhino at this point? And they that's right. They have this whole moment, and weirdly, they believe him. Uh, <laughs> as you would. Yeah, yeah. And as they walk away, we cut to under the bleachers, and it's the road worker dude just standing there. <laughs> and I'm like, why is he there? And why is he still wearing his hat? Like, <laughs> like you don't need it anymore. 
Is hey, it just letting me know you're the road safety. worker? Like <laughs> safety first. Safety first. <laughs> yeah, anyone can fall off the bleachers. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I just thought that was really like, weird. You know what? Of course they're going to believe it. They're a bunch of football players. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey. They're like, hey, there's a, the spirit of a uh, serial killer is, is coming after me from various bodies. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fair enough to me. That's right. So the plan here is obviously that because Park has been following us around, like the police don't think he's a bit sus and could be a copycat killer. Um, That's right. And uh, so he says to his, the coach and Ted Ramey's character, like, um, you go back uh, and uh, yeah, go back to my house. Um, why do he, why does he have to go there? I can't remember why he sends him there now. He he sends him there for some reason, and he says I can't go back there because you know they're looking out for me. Um, so he basically sends them, and he says I will meet you at the lake because oh that's right he needs his scuba diving gear. Oh it is, yeah yeah. That's right. Yeah, I was like, yeah, what? Right. No, he says, I'm going to meet you at the lake with the rhino character. Um, and we, cut to night- yeah. we cut to night time and they're waiting at the lake. Nothing's happened. And rhino's going, that's right. They'll be here soon. He goes, it's been an hour and a half since when have you known the coast to be late? So they end up going there anyway. And they're like, <laughs> well, it, this is where the, the only bit of common sense actually comes into it. He goes, it's too dark. And it's like, no <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, I can't find anything now. <laughs> Why can you? Of course you can. <laughs> waiting there. Why? Yeah. Right. Like they were going to get P- Peter Berg's uh, diver's ha- ha- hat. Um, diver's helmet. Yeah, that's right. And 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 he knew it didn't have a light. So yeah. as soon as it starts getting dark, they must have been going. Oh, you know what? Probably not going to happen tonight. Yeah, we'll have to do it tomorrow. Eh? <laughs> it's going to happen. So and then so yeah that's right so they decide to go back to the house I th- think he goes on his own though doesn't he I don't remember Rhino's character being there um, I yeah no he goes on his own he I don't know where Rhino goes oh, no I don't either anyway but he turns up and he finds um, the coach character in the shower <laughs> uh, <laughs> washing blood off his hands and then as he climbs out he has the gammy leg he's like oh no okay you're the oh here we go you possess, and he's trying to convince the coach that he's, he's you're a good soul, you're in there somewhere. Um, and then he discovers the dead Ted Raimi character in the closet, um, and yeah, realizes that he's going to be in really a bad way. The coach character tries to, like the good side of the coach's soul, tries to win over the guy, and he only the only way he feels like he can do it is by stabbing himself, essentially, and killing himself, mm. um, which he succeeds in doing. And obviously, then Horace has to jump into another character um, at some, somehow. And then uh, the police turn up. And uh, oh, is it, no, it's, the, it's the dad turns up first, isn't it? The foster dad. That's right. Um, and then he's going like, you know, what's going on? You're losing your mind, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, the cop turns up and he's like, I can't protect you or something like that. And then... Uh, he, then he gets electrocuted. He goes, what's with the damn electri- electricity in here? Yeah. Um, and then the cops kind of have to take uh, the guy away. They, they they cuff him, put him in the back of the car, and as he's sitting there, he sees uh, the foster dad coming out with a gammy leg. Oh, no. Uh, Got the dad. Dad. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Rhino turns up, smashes the window and hauls... <laughs> Pulls the guy out, uh, Jonathan out, and says, "Go, run, get away." Um, and then, uh, and then the um, the foster dad, possessed foster dad character, goes, "Oh, you know, he's getting away. Get after him." He goes, "Forget it. I'll get him myself." And then goes chasing after him in his car. Starts, and then they end up kind of this chase sequence, and they end up climbing up the side of this uh, building, which just so happens to be a TV studio. Um, and again, the, the guy is shooting at, at Jonathan, missing him every single time. You're just like, yeah. No idea of how to, how to shoot and aim and kill somebody, even though he's a serial killer. Um, <laughs> you know, and a cop to boot. So you think it's a cop, good yeah. combination. Um, but yeah, no dice. And they end up climbing on top of this, anyway, building. They climb up the mast to where the TV area is. There's a big confrontation scene. He says to his foster dad, again, the same stick, I know you're in there, you know, help me, help me. Um, 
and somehow there's a confrontation. I can't remember how it happens, but the do- the foster dad ends up hanging off the side of the dish, and at this point, the transmission kind of uh, yeah it projects the radio signals, the TV signals through the dad, um, and takes the soul of uh, Pinker along with it. Um, does the dad die at this bit? Is he? Does he die or is he still around? I can't remember. I can't remember I... if he gets killed or not. Anyway. Uh, yeah. No, I'm not sure. Mine's, my mind's gone blank. I don't like, remember seeing him again after this point. No, I don't. So, uh, but anyway, so they, he ends up, they realise then he's in, so basically now what's happening is, and this is done in very quick, kind of a very, very quickly done. Mm. But essentially the Pinker character then jumps from TV station to TV station. And then he comes into people's homes through the TV sets and he kills them before jumping yes. back into the TV sets again. And it's done, as I said, in a very kind of quick fashion. They realise that there's a copycat going in in there despite That's the threat. Right. Um, John, John, John Tesh and he yes. gives us the, the lie down. That's it. Keeps, brings everyone up to speed. Yeah. So with that in mind, uh, then... Um, Rhino teams up with a couple of football mates and they decide that they're going to basically disable the, the power station mm. and by kind of go, going in and dismantling it, essentially, is the idea, and cutting out all the power to the, to the city. Um, and they decided to do it at the stroke of midnight. At the same time, Parker's gotten hold of a news channel and says, I need you to film here. Um, and I need to have Big it plan. Rolling. Yeah. You need to have it rolling live. Uh, before midnight, and I, I will midnight. bring the killer to you, is what he says. And they go, oh, okay, yeah, fair right. enough, yeah, sure. They're they're, uh, they're a little suspicious for about five yeah. seconds. Yeah, that's right. And then they go, you know what? We're going to believe this kid. Yeah, we're going to do it. Yeah, he kind of he does say something like, "I'll just take you to another news station," and they're like, "Ah, oh, yeah, right. Well, we'll, we'll film it. It's all right." We'll <laughs> <laughs> and string yeah. so I'll not do anything for a story <laughs> that's it that's it so we're coming into the climax of the film the last act so the, the confrontation between Jonathan and uh, did we I don't know if I've mentioned this but we have pockets around this where Alison's spirit keeps turning up as well oh yeah there's that little dream sequence yeah. where she she gives him the, the necklace which is the yeah. weirdest thing ever because she just does the weird creep thing you know yes. have you ever seen that, that Andy Sandberg sketch where he just sort of it's called the creep yeah. And he just appears out of nowhere and just does that sort of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She does that in every single shot to yeah, freak him out. And he like runs away and then suddenly she's like. <laughs> <laughs> she appears again and is like, what are you doing? Stop scaring him. They, Stop they, jumping yeah. into frame with the hands out and everything. <laughs> He's got the full. Um, Elsa Lanchester hands going in. Everything. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, he's done that before with Deadly Friend, as we said. Like, it's, it's obviously a bit of a Wes Craven go to. Um, but, like, it's so odd. It is odd. It is odd. They missed the boat there, too. Like, we could have really had a bit of um, an American werewolf in London moment, you know, with the, yeah. with the best friend turning up and having that kind of, that would have been kind of cool. Yeah, that would have been freaking her out a little bit, him out a little bit in that sense. And then yeah. turn up and, and then play she on the. She She sort of does earlier on, and then they yeah. just get get rid of the blood because it scares him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, um, I'm so cold. And then they, they look like they're going down that path, that miracle world from London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then they just completely forget about it. So yeah, they should have stuck with it. I reckon that no, 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 no. I don't want all this blood on me all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, play me off and put me in a beautiful night dress, and I'll just, I'll just act creepy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'll just be a bit odd. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, so the reason I'm saying that is because uh, <laughs> this is this is hilarious because part of the plan, right, involves Jonathan still trying to dive to find the necklace, which he does um, in the lake at night time when he said he couldn't do it earlier when it was dark. <laughs> um <laughs> And yet he's still, and I'm like, that's your plan? Like, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, but he goes ahead with it and he gets help from Alison's spirit who kind of guides him yeah. to the right place to find the necklace. Yeah, that's why she's doing all the creep stuff. So yeah. she's like getting, she does the pushed along the leg thing. And, and yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. So he finds the necklace and the energy source that comes with it. Um, 
and then he goes to find uh, Parker. Um, Pinker. Sorry? Pinker. Oh, okay. you should saying Parker, because he's yeah. Parker. Pinker. It's, it, I mean, it's understandable, considering they're apparently related. Yeah. Um, wait, wait, what? So. What? <laughs> Spoiler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, haven't we gone deep into this enough to know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, it was glaring, right, freaking obvious. Yeah, that that's his dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's why they've got a connection. Pinker oh, Parker. Yeah. You say Pinker, I say Parker. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and I like this is where I'm going to need your help now because I can't remember how he finds Pinker initially again to then start going down that road of trying to track him. Oh, what did he do? Did he just start flicking around the channels and does looking he, for him? He does. Oh, yeah, that's right. He goes to the ha- this some house, doesn't he? And then he starts just trying to find him uh, with the remote control. And he basically gets him and calls to him and then he jumps well, out. He, did, he does a dream thing a dream. where he that's cracks right. him yeah. and then he wakes up and then, uh, uh, yeah, goes to the house. Yeah. And that's when he jumps into the TV set with him. Yeah. And then they and start the jumping like through. Yeah. And then they jump through like various moments of like the hate bomb and the uh, Ku Klux Klan moments, like these really bad moments that we've been witness to through TV. Wes Craven's really driving this yeah. message home, kids. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, all even, the even is- like jumping around the lounge room with that really redneck fat family. It's yes. just, it, it's really quite com- comedic. Yeah. They're, like, they're, that they're, whole they're, they're not giving a fuck, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just going. It's like, they're like, oh, just just get out of here, man. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of, uh, do you remember that moment in um, Natural Born Killers with the whole, yes. kind of, like the TV riff with uh, Rodney Dangerfield and all that kind of. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of, it kind of, I mean, obviously that's really done in a very obscure kind of uh, comical way. Um, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of that energy, same kind of energy in that scene. I think so. I think it's got. Uh, there's a little bit of satire in this. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I mean, it's it's a lot lost a lot in its silliness. Yes, it is. It's, it's a very silly film. Yeah, but well, it's, I, it, but it's also a very enjoyable film in the fact that it and in the fact that it also slips these little jibes at TV and the, the way we yeah, consume way, TV yeah. That's is it. just quite interesting. So. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. And so yeah, I mean, essentially they they jumping around all the different yeah, shit shows, lots of different shit shows and stuff. That's right, and jumping in and out. And eventually, they the, the plan comes through. So he ends up in the place where uh, he's being filmed in that with the newsroom. Yeah. Um, and there's that kind of final confrontation, and he's just um, pauses him. For, yeah, pauses him. He says, "I can control you now uh, with a remote control." And he's waiting on his friends to blow the fuse. Um, with the power grid, which they do end up doing, and that essentially traps um, uh, it traps the dude, isn't it, in the TV set? Yeah. Um, but he kind of uh, he makes a kind of a point of saying like you'll be trapped too because he's stuck in the TV as well. So and his only last power source is the video camera. He jumps through the the video camera lens. Yeah. Um, to free himself out. So. Pinker none is, of this actually makes any sense no, whatsoever. None of it does. No, none of it at all. So Pinker ends up getting <laughs> stuck in the TV set, and as he says, that line as well is like, never turn on TV again or something along those lines. Um, I'm sure they were right, writing this in snorting lines. I know. You can hear words. Oh, yeah. Then, oh, then he jumps you know what? This will work. The kids will love it, and it's yeah. like, no, it doesn't make any sense. No, that's it. No, we'll just make it make sense. Yes, we'll that's right. Uh, yeah, so the, so essentially, Pinker gets trapped in the television, essentially, and then uh, Parker destroys the Jonathan destroys the television set, jumps through the video camera lens to get back to reality again. He goes outside, and all the neighbors are kind of looking out at the sky because the clouds have lifted and they can see the stars again. And he's like, "Look, Gallison is beautiful," um, and we get close credits. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. End of the movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, okay. You said you watched it a lot. I mean, you've already said kind of some of this at the beginning, anyway. But like, just to recap, so you watched it a little bit, uh, quite a bit when you were young. You went to the movie, sorry. You watched it a fair bit on video. 
you watched it uh, recently ahead of the uh, podcast. How has your journey over the years um, gone with this film and where does that leave you now? How does it fare considering my my fandom back in the day? Yeah. Uh, I think, I think w- the difference between now and when I really used to like it was I don't smoke as much weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Are you saying it was probably marketed for a certain time and frame of mind? I think so. I think there was a bit of a haze to it. Uh, and this, yeah, I'm not talking yeah, about the bushfire haze. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. I'm free from that, the green haze that okay. I, I used to enjoy this week. So now it was. Yeah, so like now the clouds have lifted and <laughs> you're, you're watching it with a fresh face, like uh, close to 40 years on. Oh, oh you know what? It's it's. Oh, it, okay. I think I said earlier on, it it's crap. It really yeah. is a crappy film, but it's just it it doesn't take itself seriously in the slightest, yeah. which I appreciate. Yeah, you know, if you're gonna do a shit film, make sure you don't don't take it seriously because no. they just they look like they had fun making this film, and I, I absolutely appreciate the fact that uh, these guys just went. You know what? We're gonna have a bit of fun here. And none of it's going to make that much fucking sense, but let's make a horror film. And, yeah, yeah. And, it, right. and they did it. And I thought it did a great, great job. I mean, would I watch it again? Probably not. But. <laughs> See, I, okay, I guess this is where we differ, but I I only, not in, not in our view of the film, but in the sense of watching it again, but but I've only watched it the once. So I would quite happily go back, and, maybe, not maybe anytime soon, but I probably would go back and watch it at some point. I mm. I... It's not great by any stretch. It pales no. in comparison to A Nightmare on Elm Street. And Wes Craven was dreaming, thinking that he was going to ever make uh, anything that would meet that mark, at least not until yeah. Spook comes around. You could probably argue that uh, The People Under the Stairs kind of does deserve a bit more cred. Ah, oh, um, yeah. But, you know, outside of that, like, he's not going to, he was never going to build a franchise anyway, at least until yeah. the Green comes along. Um, you know what? I used to watch. I used to go and see every single Wes Craven movie around this time. Yeah, and and it wasn't till I, I think probably People Under the Stairs that I I became obsessed with. I was obsessed with Shocker, and then it just passed over to People Under the Stairs. Yeah, after yeah. After that, um, uh, it's. He's a great director, but he, and he just sort of mixes up his choices in, in what he wants to do. But he's um, you know, he, he's, he's good. He's uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't think you could take it as seriously as as say people under the stairs. That was no. kind. Of, there was some weird gothic yeah shit going on there, but it was it was his fun film as well. But it was um, this was just like this is for the stoner heavy metal crowd, I reckon. Yeah, totally. That's definitely its market. Definitely its market. And I would say yeah. that people that are still in that scene, uh, even on a modern sense, would probably still dig this film. Uh, and uh, yeah, but like, yeah, you're right. Like, it's uh, like uh, the other thing I will say, and you keep saying about the comedy and the satire thing, because Wes Craven always wanted to make, like, to him, satire was where he wanted to go. It wasn't horror, it mm. was satire. So you can see him trying every chance he can. To ring it out, especially during the eighties, um, I'm using. Well, Ramiro, Ramiro had already done it, so for his, you know, Day of the Dead and stuff. That's right. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, Wes Craven was constantly trying to do it. I don't think he really was ex- successful. I don't think he was a successful satire writer. No. I think he needed the right writer, and he had that with Kevin Williamson with um, uh, the Scream. Yeah, um, exactly. That was the good. That was where the marriage happened, really. That's yeah. Where really finally yeah. set on it and, and definitely and definitely yeah i mean he had that with with nightmare on elm street but that was such a that was a one-off and he, he couldn't oh look part three was great and then wes craven's new nightmare was just absolutely genius oh i um, i can't wait to talk about that one we've we, we uh, yet to release that one yet but like i i am a huge fan of that film that was that, that i still consider that film way ahead of its time so ahead of its time yeah, yeah. so meta yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Just genius. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can't wait to review that one again. That's going to be great. Cool. All right. So, as whoops. So, as far as shock is concerned, um, I mean, you kind of said this, uh, like about whether or not it stands uh, 
true today. I don't think you do think that. Um, but would you recommend it to somebody who hasn't seen it before? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's still a fun film. Yeah. Um, it, you, but I would say, you know what? It's crap, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that, that was my take. I, I enjoyed it, even though it, it clearly isn't that good. <laughs> I, I just enjoyed the ride. Um, exactly. This, I mean, there's some really good set pieces. Yeah. The whole, um, uh, like, I love the little kids running across the street. Yeah. I love... Um, I love the creep moments from the girl yes. which, uh, jumping out of the lake and stuff. Yes. I love uh, the, uh, the the TV jumping around the different TV uh, channels. That, yeah. was, that was really cool. Yes, definitely. And, and there's, just, yeah, there's, it's, there's some really good moments that you just kind of go, you know what, fuck the rest of it. Fuck <laughs> the common sense. The little girl, especially in the in the park, it was just yeah. great as well. So, yeah, yeah, that's but, right. Um, that was cool. Yeah, so no, it was just it's just a fun film. You just it gotta is. go with it, man. Yeah, that's it. Just go with the flow. It's a good, it's a good like uh, late night uh, movie, I reckon. Mm. Uh, where your brain's not necessarily working on full full power, and you just want yeah. to have something on and to watch and just let it's it. Like a bong, and watch it. Like a bong, watch it. That's it. It's our recommendation <laughs> from the surgeons team. Uh, watch under the influence. <laughs> Um, cool. All right. I think on that note, we can probably bow out on our discussions on Shocker. Let us know your thoughts. If you uh, loved the movie way back when and still love it today, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and uh, do stick around. As I said, we are going to still kind of dig through the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movies along with uh, the people under the stairs coming up next um, and the Wedge Kramer's New Nightmare that we were talking about too. Um, so do stick around for more of those uh, as we uh, start coming towards the end of our season and till then i'm your host and lead surgeon for the podcast series song Lerte, and i was joined for this episode by miles davies see you later goodbye you're listening to the surgeons of horror podcast music supplied by peter nezik for more discussions or podcasts head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.